The Stoics argue that your thoughts and beliefs create the world you inhabit, not external circumstances. So you ought to take responsibility for your mind. Play with that. I mean, one. I mean, some of that is true, but if you have Christian listeners, imagine telling them that Christianity is a mindset. <laughs> People would say, "Well, well, now wait a minute. I think it's a little bit more than that." But there is some truth in what's said there because, so Stoicism has, whether or not this is well known. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is actually rooted in stoicism. So a lot of what we, a lot of the applications of therapy that we see today, if they're cognitive behavior, uh, CBT based therapies and Donald Robertson, who is a, uh, who is a practitioner of stoicism himself personally, I believe, and also the author of uh, how to think like a Roman emperor and recently a graphic novel called Verissimus, both excellent books. And he himself is a, I'm going to say, I don't think he's a psychiatrist. I think he's a psychologist and he practices CBT or he did before he uh, moved away from it. Uh, and a lot of what we see in therapeutic practice is actually rooted in some of stoicism. Tanner, I've not had someone from the same network on the show. So I feel like you guys, we're, we're, we're inside buddies here. Uh, on on podcasting as we've just been talking about, so uh, it's fun to have you here. Fun to be same a part of the same glass box uh, network, which I don't talk about glass box a whole lot, but that is a network. And man, congratulations on your show! I feel like you're a, a new show and yet a mentor at the same time. Yeah, you know, it's been it has been a wild ride rather quickly. And as somebody who's been in podcasting for a long time in general, and this shows that that I guess we'll talk about today is is pretty new. Uh, it, it doesn't happen very often. And when it does, you just, you just thank your lucky stars for it and you hang on for dear life as long as you can. Well, I appreciate, man. I don't, I don't know how many times I have repeated you. So you and I met at the podcast gathering up in Denver that Seth Silvers put out a uh, call out to Seth and you were asked, they put you up on stage. And I think you were asked, you know, so why is your show done so well? And you're like, man, I have no idea. And But you did come in and say, as you look at podcasting and you look at the ones that are doing well and the ones you know that aren't, it's some kind of X factor. And I have repeated that and given you credit for it, the X factor, which obviously you have in your show. And as I was reading some of your reviews, it feels like people resonate with you, which you're the host. That makes sense. But for whatever reason, you've got the X factor. They resonate with you. And I know you're building community. You've got a lot of engagement and uh, it's, it's again, it's inspiring. It truly is, Tanner. Well, thanks, man. I really appreciate that, Kevin. It's high yep. praise. Absolutely. Thanks. Absolutely. Well, you know, we're here talking, as I talked to you about with all the topics I've had on the show, we've not talked about stoicism, which I had not given focus to until my dad sent me Ryan Holiday's, what's his day? He's got a book. It's like daily stoicism or something. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think he has the 365 day stoic is one. Is it? Maybe it's and that. He's yeah. Got some, something like that. So that was my first kind of entry into that as a focal point. Then I got a book kind of like a daily devotion or not, something like that from a Marcus Aurelius that I got and started reading that. But here, as far as bringing it on the show and dissecting it is the first time. And something that I really appreciate from listening to your last podcast, which was one of your listeners interviewing you, which was a really cool tactic, uh, cool bit value was that you started this show. Well, I'll ask you, did I hear it right? In essence, you started your show, Practical Stoicism, because you thought, man, I got some stuff going on in my life. I want to address it. Let's go to a self-help type thing. I'm going to go and, and pursue some self-help here, as this is a self-helpful show. And I'm going to pursue stoicism. And a great way to commit to it is, how if I start a podcast? And I'll learn as I help others learn. Is that fair? That is exactly right. I had uh, previously owned a recording studio in South Portland, Maine, that really fought the good fight throughout the pandemic, but ultimately in the end didn't make it. Uh, and then the house I was living in, uh, an apartment complex, they decided to sell the building. So I was without my business. I was without a place to live. Uh, and we moved to Denver. I ended up being able to rescue some of my business and bring, and bring it online uh, during the pandemic. So, you know, I made it financially and I, I think that's lucky because a lot of people didn't. Uh, so I want to mark that that was a very fortunate thing for me. But when I got to Denver, 
man, I was stressed. I, I was more stressed than I'd ever been. And, and stoicism had been in the background since 2014, 2015, but I had drifted from it immensely. And I never really studied it deeply in those years. And it had been you know, three or so years since I'd had enough time to even look at meditations, which is what I started the podcast, which is the book you just mentioned, Marcus Aurelius's Meditation. Well, and again, I want to dig into stoicism, but I love that, that you, to apply it to your life, you dug in and started putting out these daily meditations. But I, and I would say your X factor though, is your, and, and I heard this in your interview in when you were being interviewed that you had been involved in stoicism in that pursuit for a while on your own. And you seem to have a motive, a heart for helping bring that into the modern culture, make it relevant for the modern culture. And in a lot of ways, and I see this in some upcoming things that you've got going to simplify it in essence and help people understand it. Is that a good synopsis? Well, to some extent, yes. Yeah. So stoicism is not really in totality what Ryan Holiday presents it as. Ryan Holiday presents stoicism as very useful and practical life hacks, which is to some extent what people want when they come to stoicism. When they first find out about it, it's usually through Ryan Holiday. I think he's probably uh, the biggest figurehead of the quote unquote movement in stoicism currently. He's certainly the most popular and well-read, I believe, sure. or, or uh, most read. And while that is useful, there is an aspect to stoicism that doesn't get talked about often. In fact, there are two aspects, uh, and that is the cosmology or the physics, which is pseudo-religious. It's not religious. It wouldn't qualify as a religion today, uh, and it, I don't believe it qualified as one in ancient times either, But there's all, and there's also a, phys, a, a logic component to it. So how to think, how to form arguments, and then also the origins of the universe, the cosmology. So I have a couple of goals with this project. And the first and foremost is that I have noticed as someone who's nearing 40, that the younger generation needs a little bit of help. And I imagine that people, when I was the younger generation and they were turning 40, they probably thought, ah, this younger generation needs a little bit of help. But the help that I see that they need is they have become very nihilistic. And there's probably really good reasons for that. There's not a lot of things to hope for in the world. It seems pretty grim. We have a 24-hour news cycle that tells us the world is grim. Um, and the only escape we seem to have are these, you know, either dark humor and dark memes or just endlessly scrolling on whatever social media platform we are drawn to. And I don't, and I, and I see in that vacuum of purpose, uh, and by that I mean that I, I see a lot of people who are looking for purpose and are not finding anybody to present it to them. I find some people coming in like Andrew Tate. Uh, who are not necessarily beneficial to these young men, and the young men are too young to know any better. <laughs> uh, and that is, uh, I think, problematic in the long term, since Generation Z and Generation Alpha, who are people who are between, you know, like five years old and 26 right now, uh, those young people, they're going to be our leaders and, uh, you know, the, the biggest swath of our citizenship soon enough, and they need some guidance. Now, Stoicism in its full form can be a little intimidating. I talked about logic. I talked yeah. about cosmology, right? We, we hear cosmology and God and people are like, whoa, I've got baggage with that. I don't, <laughs> those are some red flags. I'm not interested. Now the God in stoicism is very, very different from any Abrahamic religion or God, but, uh, and, and maybe we can get into that later, but the, the ethical portion of stoicism, there are three, we could call them pillars of stoicism. Yeah. We've got uh, the cosmology, the physics, the logic, and then we've got the ethics, which is what Ryan Holiday is really good at talking about and what most people know about stoicism in general. So how to treat other people, how to be resilient, you know, things like this. Uh, and I am trying to package that content in a way that is attractive to younger people and accessible which is another big part of what I'm trying to do. The language of academics can be very unaccessible, but academics, if they study stoicism, and, and that is their job in academia, if it is, they are our most knowledgeable thinkers. And yet they're published through academic presses, which are you know $100 for a book. Most people can't afford that, so it's not accessible in that way. And the language that they write in is very highly academic language. And so that's not accessible to, you know, your average 20 year old kid. Oh. So those are some things I've, I've just piled a lot on you. So well, and I want to, I want to go right there. And I, I do want to say from, again, a, a testimony, you've been doing the show for 
what, 14, 15 months? Is that about right? Yeah, we, we started it in the middle of January of last year. Okay. Well, to attest to the hunger that's apparently out there for this message, your show as of today has more downloads than mine. Last that I saw. Uh, now we just <laughs> put a bunch in the transfer. So, uh, but um, you know, it, your show's growing like crazy. I love that. So there's obviously a, yeah, a hunger for it. I do want to hit the perspective. And even as I go back to when I was given the, whatever the book uh, by for, from Ryan holiday years ago, and it talked about stoicism. Even then, my perspective is that of that was my buddy's military dad who did not have an emotional fiber in his body. That's what I thought of stoicism. I'm thinking, well, apparently there's more to this. Let me dig into this. But you type in. So I did this, you know, just in my own prep for the show, stoicism, put it in Google. And the first definition that comes up is the endurance of pain or hardship without the display of feelings and without complaint. Yeah, I know I see you smiling because that, but you know, so there's a so we got to we got to wipe that one off first. Well, Fair? well, not not wipe it well, off. Not entirely. Clarify. So, yeah. So stoicism, small s, lowercase s, and stoicism, big s, capital s. Those are two different things. And to some extent, we talk about this in a book that Kai Whiting and I are writing currently, and should be out hopefully soon. Uh, <laughs> details on that later, maybe. Yeah. Um, lowercase s stoicism is Which imagine we'll promote that a, by the way when that comes out so yeah we'll, we'll come back imagine you are a combat medic and you, you know you're trying to help people in the middle of a battlefield small s stoicism the ability to compartmentalize things that are going on in ways that you're v- very severely detaching yourself from them so that you can do the thing it might be a fire over here a dead person over here but you've got a job to do and you need to shut those emotions down that is small s stoicism and there is a place for it okay. uh, it's not always bad but in general it speaks to the repression of emotion which on the whole you know given certain circumstances, excluding certain circumstances like the one I just outlined, on the whole, it's not a great thing to do uh, because it's a, it's a repression, repressing anything probably isn't a great idea. Repressing our emotions mean we never address them and that can, that can stack up and probably has something to do with why when people get out of the military, following this example, PTSD is not uncommon. Increasingly, it is more common as we come to be able to recognize it better and, and understand it. Whereas Stoicism, capital S, speaks to the ancient virtue ethics based philosophy of stoicism that that I talk about uh, that was birthed out of ancient Greece in 300 BCE by Zeno of Citium. Well, and that's what I would draw people to. So literally if you go right now type stoicism into Google, you get the so I didn't know it in that term. So it's small s, that's the first definition and it's a sentence. Second definition that they give sounds like big s, an ancient Greek school of philosophy a philosophy founded at Athens by Zeno of of Sidium. The school that taught virtue, the highest good is based on knowledge. The wise live in harmony with the divine reason that governs nature and are indifferent to the uh, vicissitudes of fortune and to pleasure and pain. How's that? Yeah, that's pretty good, but there's a pretty big mistake in that definition. Uh, And it is in fact, one of the two things that really set stoicism apart from Aristotelianism uh, or other sorts of isms at the time. It's said there that it was that virtue was the highest good, but that's not true. In Stoicism, virtue is the only good, and everything else is what's referred to uh, as an external or an indifferent. Uh, and and there's another hang up on Stoicism that a lot of people run into and think it's very cold, calculating, and unemotional, is that when we pluralize the word indifferent, we say indifference, but that does not that does not have the same spelling as the word indifference e n c e it ends in e n t s it's a pluralization of an indifferent and an indifferent in stoicism is something that lacks the ability to impact or have any effect on our moral character our personal character and so in stoicism the only good is virtue and so the only goal really in stoicism is to develop a virtuous or good character that's the whole purpose of the philosophy. It's not resilience, as, as many people have come to think it is. Although certainly when you are attempting to develop virtue, as we'll probably get into the different aspects of Stoicism and a Stoic practice, it becomes necessary that the things you're doing to build towards that virtue make you resilient. So resilience is a side effect of the primary goal of Stoicism, which is to work towards uh, becoming what the ancients would have called a sage uh, but what we just really think of today is someone with a highly virtuous character or a virtuous character. 
Okay. I want to keep on this, this track of helping people and myself conceive healthfully and fully of what stoicism is and how to apply it to their life. That's the purpose of doing this show here. Uh, so I'm always interested in what is the populace scene? What are they believing? So there, again, I typed stoicism in, that was the first definition. And then as Google always does, there's some of the you know most popular questions per se. And I think the first one was, what is the main belief of stoicism? So I'm going to, I want to read it real fast here because I want you to do that and kind of correct it and say, yeah, that's some of the errancies or that's on par so that people can, we can get rid of the myths and the things that aren't helping us and uh, embrace the, the the pieces that are healthful, healthful for us. So stoicism, this is what it says. The main belief stoicism can be epitomized by three essential beliefs. Number one, that virtue is sufficient for happiness. Fair. Okay. Number two, that other so-called goods should be regarded with indifference. E and C E. Yes, that's true. Sure. Okay. But we wouldn't call them goods. So okay. this is this is just Google saying these things, right? Yeah, yeah. This is yeah. I mean, this is just top of the list, which yeah. I know is often uh well, that's why I pull it out because it's often errant, but that's what we see. It's what people see. Yeah, and one of the pro- one of the problems with philo- with not well with philosophy in general probably, but with Stoicism in particular, uh, is that there is such a specificity of language barrier in like a defining our terms kind of way that you can make a statement in Stoicism that slavery and world peace are indifference; they are not good or bad; they are preferred or dispreferred indifference. And when somebody who has a a modern or contemporary understanding of the word good, here's that statement. They're like, what? Stoicism sounds terrible. But when you understand that when a Stoic says good, they are talking about virtue. And when they say something is indifferent, they mean it doesn't have an impact on our ability to be good. It's different. Uh, And what often happens when you're doing what you're doing right now with the Googling and and the stuff that comes up that most people see is that it it is trying to be explained in contemporary language without an understanding of, or I wouldn't say a respect for, because it's not done out of disrespect. It's done out of like an, you know, they just don't know of the specificity of the language. So there should be a ton of parentheticals following words that you're reading right now. uh, And people don't know that. So it's really easy for stoicism to get a terribly bad rap. And, And that's why I want, that's why we're doing this or one of the reasons. And the third part that it gives there, third reason belief is that the world is providentially ordered by God. Yes. Yeah, it does. It does say that. Uh, And the stoic conception of God is in fact an animal, but stick with me because it's not the kind of animal that you're thinking of. Um, The stoic God is the universe and the stoics view the universe itself in its totality as being a kind of organism or being an animal. So in the same way that animals uh, like a zebra has legs and different appendages and hairs and such, the universe has nebulas and stars and planets and, as it turns out, humans. Uh, And the argument is, to simplify it a bit, the argument is that because an animal and any system operates in such a way that's beneficial to itself or else it cannot maintain itself as a system, then the stoic god, the, the universe, must be ordered in a way that's logical. And, and they use the term uh, in ancient times as providential, uh, and sometimes they'll, they'll even say benevolent. But the idea is essentially that we're all part of an animal, and that animal is attempting to sustain itself and thrive. And so all of the cosmos must be ordered in a way that works towards those ends. So it's a, it's a very not contemporary view of God. For example, you don't pray to the Stoic God. I mean, you can, if you like. <laughs> uh, Epictetus, in fact, called the Stoic God Zeus because that was the language of the time, but he still understood it in the way that I'm describing it. Uh, you don't pass around a collection tray for, for the Stoic God. You don't meet in houses of worship. Uh, the Stoic God does not prefer stoics over anyone else like it doesn't have its own chosen tribe of people it's just the universe doing its thing okay let's play with that for a minute because a lot of folks including me care about that vernacular and that perspective in the same way that i know of a lot of incredibly wise people who attest to the attributes of christianity even without accepting you know the trinity and and jesus whatever they they do that i 
what I'm seeing is we can do the same thing with stoicism, whether we believe in that God. Yeah. We can attribute it to I look at it and look at it uh, that the world's when we're talking about good and you said not the highest good, but good. Of course, then the question is based on what, and I would say on a higher purpose, a higher, a uh, bigger, a greater power, whatever you attribute that to be. Fair? Yeah, this is actually one of the, so there's a, a little bit of a debate between what is formally called the modern Stoic movement and traditional Stoicism or the traditional Stoic m- movement, I guess we right. can call it. Uh, and there's a little, bit, a little bit of a division and it's based around kind of what you've just said. So uh, one of the greatest scholars, uh, modern or contemporary time scholars still living uh, is A.A. A. Long of Stoicism. And he says that the ethics of Stoicism are parasitical on the physics, which includes the cosmology. So the Stoics using their logic, which was propositional logic built off of Aristotle's syllogistic logic, they were able to reason in a in a you know they were able to reason in a way that was logically sound. And for anybody who might think that logically sound means correct, it doesn't. It just means that within a certain formula, the argument is defensible. And through that, they argued the existence of God. And from that, they derived of their concept of God. Uh, and from that, they derived their ethics and everything that everything that is really popular in modern Stoicism is a direct result of the logic and the cosmology of I'm not saying traditional stoicism stoicism movement, I'm saying ancient stoicism. So to believe that you could compare Christianity and stoicism in the following way. In Christianity, the primary claim is that Jesus Christ is the savior of humanity, right? I think I have. I'm not a Christian, so I don't, but I'm pretty sure that that's the that's what makes a Christian a Christian and not a Catholic, for example. In stoicism, the the claim that is parallel to that is that virtue is the only good. So if, you, if you're a Christian, it would be impossible not to believe in Christ. It wouldn't make any sense, right? Because it's, it's the whole thing that sets that particular religion apart from all the others. And in Stoicism, the thing that sets Stoicism apart from Aristotelianism, as I said earlier, is that you believe that you don't believe that virtue is a, a good or the highest good. You believe it's the only good. People would argue, and in fact, I'm kind of on the fence here about this, that if that's the primary claim of Stoicism, that that's the thing that really differentiates it, then if you believe virtue is the only good, you don't need to adopt anything beyond that claim to include the cosmology. But I think if you were a Christian today who believed in Christ, but said you didn't believe in the God that Christ was a son of and also a part of, that there would exist some cognitive dissonance in your in your, in your belief structure, right? You wouldn't be able to necessarily explain why you followed the teachings of uh, Jesus or why you thought he was important in a way that was really fulfilling to anybody who really wanted to know and understand. And I think that Stoicism, while you can certainly claim that virtue is the only good and you can live a very fulfilling life and be, a, be very helpful to the cosmopolis, as we refer to it, the world city uh, in Stoicism, you do have a degree of uh, cognitive dissonance because that claim is based off of something that you are pushing to the side and saying this is no longer relevant because we live in a world that has more science and 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 so on and so. I mean, I'm sure everybody knows that argument, but 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 it, there's a similarity there, and it's clever for you to pick up on it. Well, I I live within that cognitive dissonance in my own faith. Uh, yeah, I came from a Christian background and I do, and then not, this isn't the point of the show, but I, I, I believe in, in Jesus Christ. And yet you take the trappings of Christianity and the religion, not, I don't, I'm not, I'm not kosher with that. So there's a lot of cognitive distance for me to even speak that, but to this, my gosh, there's, as I, as I look and study stoicism and, and have been now and look at what you're doing, I would wish that most of my own Christian brethren would tune in and apply this no different than I would say, man, wouldn't you pick up a book on Buddha and look at some of the practices that we don't have over here on the Christian side and we're suffering from. So, so now to come up and bubble back up another one of the primary uh, information offerings on, on Dr. Google here was Stoicism, kind of a, this is a basic one, a philosophy of life that maximizes positive emotions, 
reduces negative emotions, and helps individuals to hone their virtues of character. I saw that. I thought, who does not want that to a degree? Now, I saw you take a deep breath there. Even that, though, does that feel a little little off there? It feels, yeah. a, well, it feels a little markety. Right, which is you know oh, fair, fair enough. You got yeah. you got to mark you got to market yourself to get found these days, I suppose. But so it mentions the virtues there. He, here's here's another comparison I'll make with Christianity. In Christianity, there are Christians, your everyday Christians, right? The people you pass on the street, say hi to. Maybe you don't even know they're Christian, just people. And then there are priests and monks who study the faith in a very different way <laughs> than your everyday Christian does. Right, and. I think it would be odd to say that your everyday Christian wasn't a Christian. They certainly identify that way, and maybe they're free to identify that way, I suppose, if they want. But to suggest that your average everyday Christian has the same understanding as a priest or a monk, that is, that's, it's, that's kind of a hard claim to make because a priest or a monk is studying something very intently. It's all they do, right? And in Stoicism, it's, it's something similar. Like we have people out there who are, and I consider myself to be a Stoicism communicator in addition to being a philosopher of Stoicism. And, and some of what I have to do, we talked about at the outset, is simplify the language and make things approachable. Mm -hmm. and, and if you present Stoicism on day one as this thing with highly specific language and all these very archaic rules or archaic concepts or that would seem archaic to the person first coming to it, then you're going to do yourself a disservice. You're making pushing. it a religion. You are, yes. And in, and in today's sense, not only is Stoicism not a religion, and nor was it ever, it very much puts up some of those flags because it is, I think, it's fair to call it a spiritual practice because it requires that sort of commitment and attention. Okay, fair. So this this one, so I got, I got one more, and then I'm going to leave the definitions here because this one is one that was most inspiring to me, probably Tanner, uh, the Stoic mindset. Again, this is right at the top of Google, but the Stoic mindset. And I, I know I'm not, I'm not pulling out the resources for each one. This was just the the front lines. It said, in the same sense, Stoicism is a mindset based on a set of observations about how the mind and world works. The Stoics argue that your thoughts and beliefs create the world you inhabit, not external circumstances. So you ought to take responsibility for your mind. Play with that. I mean, I mean, some of that is true, but if you have Christian listeners, imagine telling them that Christianity is a mindset. <laughs> People would say, well, well, now wait a minute. I think it's a little bit more than that, but there is some truth in what's said there because so stoicism has, whether or not this is well known, um, cognitive behavioral therapy is actually rooted in stoicism. So a lot of what we, a lot of the applications of therapy that we see today, if they're cognitive behavior, uh, CBT based therapies. And Donald Robertson, who is a, uh, who is a practitioner of stoicism himself personally, I believe, and also the author of uh, how to think like a Roman emperor and recently a graphic novel called Verissimus, both excellent books. And he himself is a, I'm going to say, I don't think he's a psychiatrist. I think he's a psychologist and he practices CBT or he did before he uh, moved away from it. Uh, and a lot of what we see in therapeutic practice is actually rooted in some of stoicism. And I think that that's what's kind of led to the popularizing of it in the way that a lot of people talk about it. It's a mindset. Uh, it's a way to control your emotions. It's you know the things that we've been talking about up till now. And those things are a side effect of practicing stoicism because one of the core tenets of stoicism is the idea of uh, uh, impressions and assent, A-S-S-E-N-T. Okay. Uh, so an, an impression is, let's give an example. Um, so you're walking, uh, a, I don't know, around your house and your significant other hides around a corner and pops out and scares you. And you panic immediately, right? This, this is not an emotion you can control. You're scared. Someone scared you. Uh, but then you realize it's your significant other and you get to make, you can, you now enter a state of, let's say, logical thinking, and you can, you can assess that situation and make a decision about how to feel about it. So an impression is, I'm trying to think of a very simple way to say this, an impression is like an unconfirmed sense of what might be going on. And then assenting to an impression is saying, okay, that's the thing that's going on. And so I'm going to commit to believing it as a fact. Yeah. So if a friend is late for dinner, 
and they've been late before. And you're like, I bet this flaky dude just forgot and hasn't even taken a shower yet. He's going to be so late. What a, what a loser. That is an impression, now, albeit based on some information in the past, but you have an impression about what is going on at the moment. And if you assent to it, what the Stoics suggest is that by assenting to false impressions, we create a kind of forking of additional um, conclusions that we might draw that lead us further and further away from the ability to develop a virtuous character. Because if, the, if our view of the real world is inaccurate and illogical, then we cannot build towards virtue because we don't understand reality. Uh, and so a, a, a basic tenet of Stoicism is to investigate your, your impressions and your emotions and decide whether or not they are well, logically sound, whether they're worth assenting to. And we don't necessarily, the, one of the side effects of that is that when something happens, a Stoic will seem like they're not bothered by the thing that's happened. But what, but what they're actually doing is trying to determine whether their immediate impression of what is happening is something worth assenting to or something they don't have enough information to assent to. Okay. Right there, because that is, I mean, Tanner, that's my background is I was the small S and just uh, stuffing emotions. I don't deal with them. I don't have a place for them. You know, I was a pro athlete. We don't need emotions out here. We just need to go for the line and win. Uh, and that was great on the battlefield, like you talked about, uh, that has a place for that maybe, but to compartmentalize or shut down. Well, no, to, com to compartmentalize, but I was actually just shutting down. So we're saying, no, that's, that's not, that's not stoicism. That's not health. And we know that from a psychological standpoint, neither is being a hundred percent controlled by the emotion X happens. It's a stick. You think it's a snake and it totally takes you out and you're gone. That's not helpful either. So you're talking about a middle ground and I want to hit that. So you, when you talk about impression, Impression, is it relevant to say interpretation? And when you talk about assent, is it fair to say taking that interpretation and developing a belief upon that, neither of which is reality? Let me stop there and that because then I want to come to that aspect of reality. But is that interpretation and belief of those? Yes. Some of the language you're using is a bit contemporary, but yes, yeah. essentially there's an impression and you know we think it's one thing, but then we stop it and we think, well, is it this really this thing? Because if I move forward believing it's this thing, I'm going to take certain actions. And if I'm wrong, well, those actions could actually be not so great. Uh, so I better be careful about determining if what I think is actually true. So, so yes, to some extent, I think it's fair in the way you've just synopsized it. Yeah. Okay, then come to, and you said this a moment ago uh, at the end of a phrase, helping us to understand reality. That I keep coming up against that, Tanner, with the, I just had on Vienna Farron and her book is The Origins of You and How We Come to Beliefs Early in Life Based on What We Understand, which is not necessarily reality, but it, it brings up the aspect of are, are, are we understanding reality? What does that even mean? Does that mean that we are interpreting a version of reality? Is there a static objective reality? Which I actually said, in essence, there's not. And, and I was corrected by a therapist I had on the show, Terry Rios. He says, no, there's, there's a objective realities. If a car drives through my wall right now, or, or like you said, if somebody springs out and, and surprises you, that's an objective reality. Somebody hid, they sprang out and they, they did that's objective reality. Then it's the interpretation, or as you said, the impression, okay, why, why did they happen? What, what, why did that happen? What was the intent or the motive behind that? Especially when you get into relationships that feels like, or, or even if it's not, even if it was a, it wasn't a person, it was a, you know, a chunk of airplane that fell off and how we interpret that of going, oh my gosh, I'm the most unlucky person on the planet or that person meant me harm. And we go to a negative interpretation or a positive, but it does bring into play. And I keep coming up against this on, okay, what are we talking about when we look at reality? So from, I'm going to ask that from a stoicism standpoint of how are we discerning reality? Are we saying that there is an absolute factual reality or it's open to an interpretation. We're trying to bring it to one that gives us the most life and health. 
Well, it's really interesting that you ask it that way because so there's a couple of things I think I need to point out here for this to to make sense. So give give me give me time to do that. Otherwise, I think we, I might get a little. Hey, part of our new trade. You just did this with Glass. Yeah. You got to make a trailer for your show as they're promoting it on NPR and all the other stuff. And ours is grappling with these messages. So here we are, you and I, we're grappling. <laughs> so, so one of the reasons that logic is so important in Stoicism, if you think of, if you think of grammar, right, you can write a letter. And you can, and your letter can have terrible grammar in it, but it could still perhaps get its point across. It, it would be a little sloppy, but it would get the point across. Right now, graduate the letter to something more like a country's constitution. Imagine if you had a constitution with just dozens of grammatical errors in it. Think about the kind of negative effect that would have when a court, for example, was attempting to enforce constitutional issues, right? Or to de deliberate around constitutional issues. So that's grammar in writing and the effects that it can lead to. Uh, logic is a lot like grammar uh, in, in, in interpreting the world. So imagine you have a very logical way of looking at uh, whether or not something is true. If it's if it's poor if it's very illogical way of, of doing that well one time that might not be a big deal, but if you stack illogical assumption opinion uh, assent if if you stack those too many times you wind up so far left so far in left field that your interpretation of reality is just not in alignment with what is even close to being objective now. Whether or not we live in an objective reality from an individual's perspective. That's a, probably a little bit more complicated because stoicism is, right, the universe exists and there's a monitor in front of me and we're having a conversation right now. And unless we turn into infinite reductionists where we're like, well, we're really just atoms, you know, like <laughs> th then those things are objectively true. We are communicating right now. So, so in a sense, the universe is objective and the things that go on in it are objective. But in stoicism, everything is highly contextual. So one of the reasons that it can be hard to communicate what exactly something stoic is or, or what it means to do something in a stoic way is, and we'll get this a lot in our Discord community, younger kids will ask, I'm having a, a difficult time with my girlfriend and we've just broken up. What's the stoic way to deal with a breakup? Well, the answer to that is that there is no stoic way to deal with a breakup. There's no stoic way to deal with a job interview. There's no stoic way to, you know, no blanket stoic way to do these things. It applies to everyone. Stoicism is very contextual. It comes down to the individual, uh, and it's based on the idea of roles. So in stoicism, there are a few different kinds of roles one can be assigned. Uh, some of those roles can be assigned by society, right? You're a neighbor. That's not a role you took on yourself, but you are a neighbor. Uh, you're a citizen of a city, for example. And so that role comes with certain responsibilities. And a virtuous thing to do is to fill your uh, fill your roles well. So in that case, maybe you're walking down the sidewalk of your neighborhood, you see a piece of trash on the ground and you pick it up and throw it away. That's something that would be filling your role as a neighbor or a citizen in a neighborhood uh, well. Then there are roles that might be assigned by uh, the government. So you're a taxpayer. So and I don't want to get into an argument about that, but let's right. say you're a taxpayer. And so it, it is a virtuous thing to pay your taxes and to act as a, act in whatever appropriate capacity you act as a, as a taxpayer. Don't, you know, don't cheat, don't cheat the tax system, I guess would be the best way to do that. Uh, and then there are roles that are the result of your actions. So you might have a romantic relationship with someone and now you have a child. So now you're in the role of mother or father uh, and you need to fill that role well. And then there are roles based on our personal preferences. So we might be, we might consider ourselves activists or in, in, my, re in my case, I am really interested in, in planning to move to Portugal. And that's a personal preference. So I could take my uh, role as a citizen of America and a taxpayer in America and as a stoicism communicator and philosopher of stoicism. And, and those are all roles that I take very seriously. And I can say, well, if I move, if I take my personal preference to be the role of a person who lives in, uh, who becomes a neighbor in Portugal, can I fulfill those other roles? Well, I can vote from Portugal. I can pay my taxes from Portugal. I can still teach stoicism and be a stoicism communicator in Portugal. Uh, so I think, yes. So you've got your personal preferences, 
Those are personally assigned roles. Then you've got roles that are assigned by your government, roles that are assigned by your actions, roles that are assigned by your society. And stoicism takes filling those roles very seriously. It doesn't mean your roles can't change, uh, but it does mean that once you take on a role or once you're put in a role, you have to fill it well and you should not look to shirk those responsibilities and those roles. Okay, so now you're asking about uh, whether or not there's a stoic way to do X, Y, or Z. Well, the answer is, the, the and the answer to that question is in fact a question what are your roles and how would how should you behave in respect of those roles in this given situation so you're married let's say so one of your roles is a husband and let's say you're also a parent so one of your roles is that you're a father and your personal preference and the personal preference of your spouse is that you want to get divorced and so you the way you make that decision is not a strictly emotionally driven uh not a strictly emotionally driven approach. Instead, you say, well, I have a role. My role is as a father. My role is as a, as a husband. What are my responsibilities in the role of husband? Well, I'm supposed to do X, Y, Z, whatever those are, because they'll be specific to you. Not everyone is a husband in the same way. Can I fulfill those roles if I'm no longer a husband? Well, no. Okay. So does my spouse also uh, want to get a divorce? Well, yes, she does. Okay, well then great. That role is handled. Uh, and you might be able to see from just that example that navigating a divorce from a stoic approach or from a stoic perspective, the stoics would not have ne necessarily been pro-divorce. They wouldn't have been anti-divorce either. They, they just would have been, don't quit too soon, <laughs> right? Would have been their position. And then you have to look at, okay, well, I'm a father. Can I still be a father if we get divorced? Well, of course you can. Uh, and whatever your other responsibilities are. And if the answer is I can do all my other roles well, or I can walk away from those roles in a respectful and responsible way, then I can make this decision, which is a personal preference to get a divorce in this example. Does it then to look at that stoic way? So I appreciate that. It, it's honoring our roles, being aware of them, honoring our roles, accepting those roles, and what I heard you say is taking responsibility for those roles. And then are we looking at back to that aspect of virtue? What is virtuous and good within those roles, which especially if we're talking relationships come to husband and wife, that's where it can get dicey because what is virtuous and good for one person could differ from the other. But is that, could we say that that's the stoic pursuit intent? The Stoic intent is to move closer to virtue, to be to being yeah. the Stoic sage. So I guess I need to probably define what the Stoic sage is. A Stoic sage is someone who always acts morally and appropriately. They never fail. Now, there's arguments as to whether or not the Stoic sage has ever actually existed or whether it's attainable. Uh, like, for example, in Buddhism, there's a Buddha. And there's reaching enlightenment. In Stoicism, we, we don't have that. There's an ideal that we are ever working towards, but it's not the point of Stoicism, right? It's kind of like we've got our eye on a prize. We're pretty sure we're never going to get there. It might not be attainable, but we treat it like it is because of the effects it has on our ability to move towards it better. Uh, if we didn't believe it existed, it would be hard to it would be hard to justify a lot of the things that we that we say are important in Stoicism. So going back to the marriage example. You said what's virtuous for you or what's appropriate for you may not be virtuous for another person. This actually brings up the concept of indifference and externals that we were talking about before. You are not capable of making another person more or less virtuous. In fact, technically, no one can be more or less virtuous. They can either be virtuous or vicious. Uh, and this has a little bit of a line. This has a little bit of parallel with Christianity because in Christianity, the idea is that everyone is fallen in some way uh, and they're imperfect. And only through, uh, and I'm probably muddling this because I'm not a Christian, but only through Jesus can you find, you, you know, only, can you be saved? Well, in Stoicism, you are vicious until you are virtuous because there's a concept in ancient Greek philosophy that's called the unity of virtue. And that is that if you imagine a puzzle, a puzzle that is missing one piece is not a complete puzzle. It's it, it could be closer to being a complete puzzle, but it's not. But it's not a complete puzzle. Virtue is the same. Uh, 
in order to be virtuous, you have to have mastered the cardinal and subordinate virtues. And the cardinal virtues are the ones that we see on hats and <laughs> memento mori coins and things like that. All right. You've got wisdom, uh, justice, bravery, and uh, temperance, or if you prefer, self-control. So those are the cardinal virtues, and beneath them are subordinate virtues like kindness or charity, uh, you know, or, or any other thing that you might. Which, from a Christianity the, standpoint, if you think the Bible, we're talking in essence about the fruits of the spirit. Uh, I don't know them, but yes, probably that s- sounds like it. Well, yes. I'm throwing that out for my Christian folks who <laughs> will know that because you just spoke some of them. So yeah, very much aligned. So yeah. If so, in that you, I don't know if you just said this as you're talking about virtuous or vicious. And I, I, I meant to come to this earlier because you talked about mindset when I was going through some of the definitions of mindset and you said, you know, ah, some of the Christians may not like that. I, I agree. And I, man, I'm sure not here to pick on Christianity or, or, or any, you know, religion in essence, but I feel like that's a lot of times what is missed in many religions is we have the letter of the law and we're not following the spirit of it. We come back to Jesus. And I think it's very much about the mindset of how we love other people. And I would say virtuously, and that is absolutely a mindset. I think that's a lot of what has gotten Christianity specifically. And, and again, any religion in hot water is by doing things that don't seem virtuous. And I see what you say that you're about, but that doesn't seem like you're little, I'm not feeling your virtue. And we see that. So coming back to mindset, I feel like that's huge. And that is what I experience, even as I read, yeah, Marcus Aurelius and read his, his stuff is there's so much intent to be self-aware, to be self shoot. I was just going to say, and and this isn't going to come across right. Help me with this. I was going to say self-contained. But if we're to say that not affected by the environment, that we are aware of the like the contextual aspect of what's happening, and we're able to not let it rule us. That's what I meant by self-contained. It's probably not the best word. Is there a better one? Well, self-directed? No, I mean, well, As opposed to know. environment? Yeah. I think what you're getting at there is that our externals have no impact on us. And in, in concerns to virtue... That is true because in Stoicism, the things that we control are our thoughts, some of our emotions. Like I said, you can't help if you get scared when a lightning bolt lands right next to you, right? You're going to be scared. Yeah. Uh, And our attitudes towards things. Those are the things that we're able to control in Stoicism. And people talk about the dichotomy of control. Maybe we can get into that a little bit. Um, But as far as, as far as, I guess, being self sufficient, maybe ask that again. I want to make sure that I'm that I'm answering it well. Well, my, my premise was in, more in regards to being yeah, self-aware, being, as you talked about, contextually aware of what's going on around me and taking mm-hmm. into consideration more than just my immediate boom reaction of, mm-hmm. uh, of fear, that emotion, I'm not shutting it down. I'm aware of it, but okay, let me, let me step back and, and question that. And then in regards to the environment, and this could even go back to, and I know you said this was small as stoicism, but back to the battlefield or back to whatever, where regardless of what's going on, we need to take care of things here. So I'm not going to let the environment, the chaos, the whatever, I'm not going to let it control me. I am going, and you actually just mentioned control. I am going to control me based upon my, and I tend to say values, but you're saying virtues. And I, I think those are, are very parallel, but I'm going to let those control me again. Doesn't mean I'm dead to my emotions. Doesn't mean I'm unaffected. I'm still sad. I'm still fearful. I'm still whatever, but I'm going to take a deep breath, be self-aware, look at the context. And then I said self-contained earlier, but self-controlled possibly was the question. Well, I think what, I think what you're getting at here is that everything that, everything that matters, everything that we need to be focusing on happens internally. Is that, is that kind of what you're getting at? Absolutely. Yeah. That, that yeah the world's great. going I've on. Just, and, I've just yeah. set you up. That's wrong. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, to some, that's fine. <laughs> to, to some extent that is, to some extent that's true, right? Because what, what, what we say in stoicism is that, so I mentioned the dichotomy of control a minute ago. So Epictetus talks about the dichotomy of control. It's kind of like his thesis paper. If he had one, no one talks about this idea of dichotomy of control more than, or maybe even before 
at least in that framing, uh, before Epictetus. And Epictetus starts, uh, I, can't, I think it's the Enchiridion, he starts the Enchiridion by, by, by commenting on this specific thing, that there are things which we can control and things which we cannot control. Although that's not exactly the language he uses. Some people say there are things which are up to us and there are things which are not up to us. Okay. I think, a more, I think a more accurate translation is there are things we have the power to choose and things we do not have the power to choose. The, we do the, not or should not, because you, you've got me into thinking about dysfunctional relationships and the, the aspects mm-hmm. that we try to take responsibility or control of other people's behavior, let's say, which oh, which absolutely, is, absolutely. We cannot control another person's yeah. behavior. Yeah. I mean, we can, you know, we can push somebody downstairs and in that way we've controlled that they're falling downstairs, but we don't control how they fall <laughs> in that or case. How they feel about it yeah. Yeah, or how they even feel about it. Right. So uh, one of another basis or another basic concept in stoicism is that if, if there are things we have the ability to choose, and, and I'll just say for the sake of argument here, things that we have control over and things we don't have control over, then if, if we can identify that with practice frequently over and over again, the difference between what we have control over and what we do not, it becomes easier to feel less anxious about the things we don't have control over. Now, something else that's tied up in this is the Stoic idea of fate, which is incredibly complicated, but the Stoics were fatalists in a way. Uh, they were not determinists. Some people argue they were soft determinists, but essentially what the Stoics believed, and if, if academics are listening, this is a huge argument within academia. Whenever, whenever anybody tries to explain Stoic uh, uh, fatalism or Stoic determinism, somebody's always disagreeing with somebody else, right? You're not wording it right. That's technically wrong. It means this. So I'm going to try to do my best here. The Stoics believe that in something called the great conflagration, which you can think of as just a cycle of birth and death of universes. Now, what it technically is, is a huge fire that burns the whole universe up, and then it starts over again. And that just happens over and over again. We're in that cycle currently. That's not something I know we could ever prove. I personally don't believe that. But hey, I've got no way to falsify it either way. From the birth of a universe, there is a sequence of events set into place, and those sequence of events cannot be changed. However, human beings, and my friend Judy Stove will absolutely hate this analogy because she hates, she hates mechanical and machine analogies, but human beings are like little decision machines. So we have the ability to, let's imagine a web of events. And at every point where a string in that web crosses another string, there's a person. And so that web is expanding. And as soon as it hits a person, a person has the ability to make a decision. And the decision that that person makes expands out, determines the ongoing direction of the thread that they're connected to, right? So it's not that the world will only happen in one way over and over and over again. It's that the world will happen in a way or the universe will play out in a way that is dependent upon a human person's ability to make appropriate or virtuous decisions. So the, the, the basis of wanting to develop virtue ties into fate in that we will through virtuous decisions, appropriate decisions is often how they're referred to. We will create a better existence. And that is the, that is the reason why we work towards virtue, because we, we want to be able to reason our decisions in such a way that the continuation of that thread goes in the, let's say the best way possible. And that, so I'm thinking about virtue and this, again, I haven't used that term necessarily, but we look at virtue and good. We come into this in the health and wellness sector a lot to say, you know, what is, what is truth and right? It must be a raw carrot, not a hot pocket, right? Well, and and then, yeah, I get the kickback from my doctor friend. He says, well, it depends if you just came out of the desert and you're near starvation, that hot pocket is absolute life. Okay. Okay. We got that in general though, with virtue and in this topic, what I'm grappling with is we're looking at the decisions. I appreciate that the decisions that then have, you know, ripple effect, butterfly effect for everything, but those decisions that are the most, and the term I keep coming to is it's the most contextually, the best we can understand the most life giving to everyone involved. Well, that's interesting. Um, is virtue 
tied to whether or not something is life giving. I don't. I don't think so. I think that. Well, well, well let me play. Let me put throw one thing because when we talk about good, it's so, and we put that out in the culture. You know, right now we're in such a vicious culture. It feels like in the media that it's black, white, and it's right or wrong. That's mm-hmm. where everything is. So when we talk about good. One side saying, "Well, good is this." The other side saying, "No, good is this." And we're trying to come in here into these beliefs and these perspectives, these impressions, as you talk, you know, talk about from stoicism Mm -hmm. and say, oh my gosh, we, you know, the average person like me and our audiences are are going, I'm just trying to figure out what to do that will give me the best life I can have, the best experience of life as we talk about in the show. So I keep coming back to, okay, what is, yeah, we're seeking what's life giving is what I keep playing with. But okay, I interrupted you because you said that you didn't know if that lined up with virtue as a stoic. So the world is a mad place, right? I think we can all probably agree with that. Whether or not it's a fact, I don't know, but I think we can all Regardless of where we are on whatever it's interesting, no doubt. belief yeah. spectrum, it's it's a weird place, and we we all seem to wish it was was somehow better. Stoics would say, "Look, virtue is the only good, the only thing that matters, because everything is derived from it. Is if you develop a good character, if you have a virtuous character, then everything you do will be virtuous, and if everybody works in this way, which is utopian to some extent, right? If everyone works in this way." then we would have a, a cosmopolis, as, as the Stoics refer to it. We have a world city that would be wonderful. It would be wonderful because everybody is acting in a morally sound, appropriate, virtuous manner. So because of the, let's say, the odds that are, or, or the, the high stakes that, that we find ourselves in currently, as at least here in America, um, nothing can be more important. Nothing can be more important. Than developing virtue, right? Now, with that recognition, and uh, or let me take that again. Um, having said that, we go back to the dichotomy of control, the ability of what we have to choose and what we have, what we can't choose. We cannot control whether other people are virtuous. What we can do is focus on our own journey towards virtue. And we have to do that because there is literally nothing else we can do. Now, that doesn't mean that nothing else matters. It doesn't mean that you don't go out and do the good work you think is the appropriate work to do based on your roles, based on your understanding of virtue and wanting to move towards it. It doesn't mean things don't matter. It means that you you have to understand that the, the way we get out of this, whatever this problem is, right? However you conceptualize that problem and depending where you are politically or religiously, you'll find you'll you'll see it as a different problem. But the only way that we get there is through becoming virtuous people. If we cannot do that for other people, if we can't make other people virtuous, which we can't, we have to focus on doing it ourselves. So we pick up the trash when we see it. We take up the responsibility to go and vote. We take up the responsibility to uh, think logically and rationally so that using that grammar analogy, again, we don't end up in left field defending things that are that the rest of the world sees as, you know, not that's not reality. How have you made so many grammatical errors, right? Again, right. In the, to go back to that example, how have you made so many grammatical errors that you wind up with this view of the world that is objectively false to most people? And that happens because we're not paying attention to our own virtue. We're not applying logic. We're not applying uh, the understanding of roles. We're not, we're not trying our best to fill our roles and act appropriately and act morally. And thank you. And in looking at this, so I did, I typed in virtuous and Oxford dictionary gives us having or showing high moral standards. So what's moral? It gives us concern with the principles of, and here it is, that word, right and wrong, behavior, and the goodness or badness of human character. This, this is deep water, uh, which I know is the point of your show. I mean, to, to selflessly you know, promote or shamelessly promote, promote the show. I mean, this is what you're doing is you're taking... Well, you do, you have a different, some various formats in your show, but a, a, a common one is you're taking a meditation from Aurelius or, or whoever, and reading that and then saying, how does this apply to life? Which it's, it's so interesting because that's really, in a lot of ways, the best that we have over on you know, a lot of religious sides. If you take Christianity and say, let's take a passage and see what did Jesus do here? What does that mean for me in my life today? I wish there was more 
pastors and pulpits doing that instead of just teaching us the past history of the Bible that we don't know? Because ultimately I'm saying, yeah, well, what does that matter to today and how I walk out my life and how it makes my life better? And through that makes life as a whole better, which that right, as I think about that, that right there is probably a great perspective. Well, I think it is. I'll ask you what you think on what we're talking about with virtue. What is this? What's going to, what's the action to take the decision to make that is relevant, fair, true to my life, but that also is for the greater good, not just me. So I I love this. Uh, So my friend, Mitch Leventhal uh, is the president of the college of stoic philosophers, which anybody who, if they're interested in checking out, they charge pennies to get into this place. I mean, it's, it's amazing. You write an essay and it will teach you everything you need to know about stoicism from the ground up. It's uh, called the Marcus Aurelius program, and you can find it at college of stoic philosophers.org. Um, O-R-G. Hey, I want to say that again, college of stoic philosophers.org. Yep. And aside from that being a great program for anybody who wants to learn actual Stoicism, as opposed to life hack stoicism or broicism or Silicon Valley business room uh, stoicism. If you want to learn actual traditional stoicism, that's a great place to do that. Anyway, Mitch said to me once that the, and he may have been quoting someone else, but he said that the, the test of stoicism when you get out of the college is prosike. So prosike is a Greek word that means to pay attention. Something that I'm trying to help people do on the Practical Stoicism podcast is to become better at this practice of paying attention because we live in a very distracting world, right? And what I mean by paying attention is that, as an example, we have a Stoic movie club and our first Stoic movie club meets, I think, next Sunday, uh, which is Easter, but that's just the way it worked out. And we are going to watch the first Harry Potter film. Now, I'm not personally like a fanboy of Harry Potter, and I think it's weird when grown adults have Harry Potter themed bedrooms, right? I think that's weird. But we're doing something uh, very interesting with the movies in our movie club, and that is that we are watching the movie from the Stoic perspective. And so we ask a question in our worksheet that is that is d- disseminated to members of the movie club uh, that asks a question like, if And if you're familiar with the film, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you're not, you'll be like, what is this gobbledygook that Tanner is saying right now? But it, in, in, the, in one of the earlier scenes, Harry visits Diagon Alley, which is where he buys his owl and his wand. And one of the questions in the worksheet is, if Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry was a school for Stoicism, what kind of stores would line Diagon Alley? And so it really gets you to think about, it gets you to parse media from a Stoic perspective, and that's helpful. Another thing I try to do in the podcast is is say, look, here's this thing written more than a thousand years ago by Marcus Aurelius, and what does that guy know about anything? I mean, like, gosh, he's just some old emperor, dead dude. Who, who, how does that apply? Well, ask that question. How does it apply? And think of your think of stoic teachings as you're approaching anything in life because if you are constantly paying attention to stoic concepts and stoic teachings then in the same way that if you were always paying attention to christian concepts or christian teachings well it is a necessary side effect that you would become a better christian or you would become a better stoic so so i think the the key is is practice practice, 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 and constant attention, 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 paying attention to what you're doing. And I think that one of the problems that modern religion has, or contemporary, I should say, religion has, is just that people have the label and they're not applying it because they're not paying attention. If Can you imagine if after every decision you made or you know whatever it is, action you took, you asked yourself, is that in alignment with my Christian values or with my Stoic values? Since that's yeah. kind of more, more so what we're talking about. The world would change overnight. Yes. And, and this goes back to that it's not about what rights you have. Those are important, but it's not about what rights you have. It's not about the fact that that person over there isn't doing what they're supposed to do. You can't control that. It's about what you are or are not doing, and is it in alignment with the values you profess to have? And, and Stoicism tries to get you to a, ha, say yes to that question as, mo, as, as frequently as possible by suggesting you practice prosike. And, and everybody, I should have said this earlier, 
uh, anyone who is on the path to sagehood, which is, again, not really the point of Stoicism, but is the ideal that we all try to work towards, the state of being a virtuous person, they're referred to as prokoptons, or actually, I think technically, the plural of prokoptan is prokoptan or prokoptantes. Uh, I'm not sure I don't speak Greek. I probably should learn that. Uh, but it, it means someone who makes progress. So in Stoicism, if you're not a sage, you're a prokoptan. And that is just a person who is making progress. You're a, you're for life. You're a student, and that's a very humbling way of looking at looking at the the journey that we're all on. I think so. Prosake, prokopton. We we can go real deep in, into some of the weeds here, man. I I know it's kind of unavoidable, right? Well, I I, I think it's relevant because it's you come back to this, and we are all living from. I believe we are all living from some for, form of faith. There's some premise some foundation even if it's a denial or a rejection we are we are responding to some aspect of faith and you talking about that this is about making progress i wish people would say that more even uh, to pick on my own background of christianity to say man i'm i'm a practicing christian just like this i'm a practicing stoic does it say that i am you mean really you like you've achieved it you've arrived and, uh, and you're all good. I mean, this is something that we are working out. I mean, my, my, my studio here is in, uh, my, my best friend's medical practice. I appreciate that. They're practicing medicine because there's not one cure all man. It's a practice. This is the practice of stoicism, what we're talking about. And I like that you said making progress. And, and I wrote down in my paraphrase of being kind of a life student. So this is the philosophy, which we haven't even used that word, but that's where you are at philosophy. Um, that you believe in and now are putting into practice by being aware of the context of every moment of your life. There? So, to, to, so to bring this back to the yes, and to bring this back to the very beginning, you mentioned that you had a Ryan Holiday book. So, one of the Ryan Holiday books I own is called "Obstacle Is the Way." Right? It's arguably probably his most successful book. It is one of the books that I mean, he just. That's the one he goes to. That, that's the one you're going to find if you Google him. That's going to be the, the number one. 20,000 reviews on Amazon. Great book. Doesn't use the word virtue a single time in the entire text. So that right there is not necessarily a criticism of Ryan Holiday. Like I said, he knows he's delivering this as life hack. That's what he does. But it should suggest that someone can be the figurehead of Stoicism in contemporary times and not be talking about actual Stoicism, so much so that they don't even mention virtue, which we talked about earlier, would be like a Christian not mentioning Christ, right? So so there's a lot of miscommunication out there, but there's a good reason for it. Okay, well, and I, I would go further, well, not further, but on another side of, of Christianity, what I feel like we is so often missed in there is, and I mentioned this before, is the fruits of the spirit. You say that you can say that you believe in anything and you can actually believe in Jesus or whatever and, and not follow his nature at all and not benefit yourself or someone else at all. So of course, then you can you know come around Robin and say, well, does that mean maybe you don't believe? I, I don't know. I, I've, I've found a lot of people who I feel, I've, even myself, I can say, man, I believe that, but uh, there's a lot of things that I believe that I don't pursue. There's things nutritionally that I believe are best that I mm -hmm. don't do because I just want this. And and that is because prosake, paying attention is really hard because sometimes it can be really painful. When, when we were talking about the divorce example earlier, what is the most common advice we hear about in, in divorce and relationships today? It's like, hey, you're not, you have no responsibility to stay there if you don't want to be there. Go and be free, little bird, right? People say stuff like that all the time. Whereas Stoicism would say, and, and probably Christianity says as well, uh, 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 you don't just, uh, uh, you're not supposed to just dip. You're supposed to work on it. Uh, and that's a harder approach to solving problems than is just, you know, this uh, pursuit of personal happiness. And, and that's something that in, in Stoicism and in ancient Greek philosophy in general, there's an idea of eudaimonia or eudaimonia, depending on how you want to pronounce that word. That's living an excellent life. And that has been somehow transmogrified in modern times or in contemporary times into this idea that there is nothing more important than the self-actualization of the individual and we have to be happy personally. Stoicism doesn't say that. So that's and, and virtue ethics doesn't say that. If virtue is the is the only good, then your personal happiness with your job 
comes not, is not good, right? That is an indifferent in your pursuit to virtue. Now, does that mean that the job you have doesn't matter? Of course not. But it means that if you're going to prioritize something, your roles and your journey towards virtue more important than whether or not you like your job, right? We hear the millennials, and I'm one by one year, I think. I'm technically a millennial. Uh, millennials will say constantly, I want to be passionate about my job. Well, what does that matter exactly? Is that, should you be prioritizing that over your responsibility to your society, over your responsibility to your family, over your responsibility to other things? And Stoics would say, probably not. There is a way to go pursue the job you want, but if it comes at the cost of everything else, if it comes at the cost of your virtue, the Stoics would say, don't do that. That's not the thing you should be prioritizing. So Stoicism in any virtue-based ethics system, which I think Christianity is as well to some extent, yeah. uh, if not completely, they're hard and they're not popular right now. People don't like them because they're they're basically saying like, look, I don't care if you're happy with your job. You That's not the point. That is not the point. It brings me back to what you said earlier about our recognizing our roles. And I'm going to say taking responsibility within them to be virtuous. So back to what you said, because my feeling is like, yeah, if you're married, that is a commitment. Just like if I uh, agree to a job and sign the paperwork, whatever, I, I have now agreed to show up on time. If I don't want to do that, then I need to renegotiate that uh, contract or quit, give my my two weeks notice, you know, well, go but, about. But, but before you do either one of those things, you have to ask yourself if, if that is a virtuous way of approaching your job. If you care about that, you have to say, uh, okay, well, I don't want to show up on time. Well, what does that say about our character that you don't want to show up on time? And, and it's a very introspective, very personal, very contextual philosophy. And that is, and Christianity is as well, I think, when practiced what I would imagine to be the appropriate way. Um, and, and that's why it's not, that's why it's not that popular right now. Well, but I, 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 and maybe this is a great anchoring point here because within this, it is, you know, what's good for you, but what's good for the greater good as well. And yet to come back to where we started, you came into stoicism looking for some personal foundation. And I'll let you put the words to that. I mean, were you looking for, I, I, I want peace. I want fulfillment. I want some aspect of control over this chaos of life. And I'm looking for it. And I think I can find it through this devotion to methodology of. Mm -hmm. I think I approached it as I don't feel like I'm the best person I can be right now. And I, you know, I'm, I'm highly stressed out. I shouldn't be stressed out. And I am. And I need to find a way to address that because I'm not, I am not fulfilling my roles because I was familiar with stoicism before I started the podcast, of course, right. but I am not fulfilling my roles. Well, I am not being a good partner. I'm not being a good, I mean, it wasn't the case, but I could have not been being a good uh, consultant in my role at the time. And there were, I was not being a good son. I didn't call my dad enough. I wasn't being a good sibling. I didn't talk to my sisters frequently enough. And I still, frankly, don't do that as much as I feel I should, making progress, paying attention, right? Prosuke uh, and, and Prakapton. Uh, and so I approached it as a way to make progress, to move a little bit forward to being uh, towards being a better version of myself and ultimately, hopefully, towards being a virtuous character. That's how I approached it. That, that was the whole reason behind it. Okay, I'll bring in a, a, something I know about. You actually mentioned it, that you're looking at, at going to Portugal. And is it relevant to say there's an aspect of you looking at your role as an American and saying, there are some things there that I don't line up with. So to be virtuous and honoring of that, I think that it would be, be, be best for me to step away into something that I more align with. And that's an aspect of virtue. Sure. So for example, if I were a governor or a politically active person who played an important role in Congress or the Senate or something, it would be pretty wholly irresponsible of me to move out of the country, right? But my role as I've either taken on myself or has been assigned, really has been assigned to me by my audience at this point and the people that I, uh, that I teach uh, or mentor, I think is a better word, that 
is a, a role I take very seriously and one that doesn't suffer based on where I am. I'm fortunate enough to be a podcaster and, and the American responsibilities, voting, uh, et cetera, voicing dissent or, or agreement where that's appropriate. That can be done from anywhere. I mean, it's done from Denver, Colorado currently, and it can be done from Lisbon, Portugal, if, uh, if I get there. Well, hey, man, I'm grateful that you are doing it from Denver and you will be doing it from uh, Portugal. And I'll put this all in the intro of the show, but I'll go ahead and ask you to speak to it now. Obviously, the best thing people can do is whatever podcast platform you're on right the second, go find Practical Stoicism and subscribe to it to get more into this. But you've also got a, co- a, a couple, I think, engagement points. You mentioned Discord, your community um, tell people where they can engage with you in this, uh, in there, and, and if there's others as well. Sure, and, and thank you for asking that. Uh, so we have a Discord community that has just crossed 600 and some odd uh, members recently. We launched it just a couple of months ago, so we're pretty happy with the growth. A lot of people in there, over 40 countries at this point represented. Uh, and you can find that by going to stoicismpod.com forward slash Discord, totally free to join. Uh, you can find the podcast, of course, at stoicismpod.com. And we have something called the Stoic Path, which is something between independent private study and going to the College of uh, Stoic Philosophers, something like more like an academic dive. Uh, and we view it as a way for people who are looking to who are looking to practice Stoicism as a serious life philosophy themselves to connect with uh, other people who are on this are on that same page because that can be hard to find. So it's a community in that way. Uh, and have some lead projects. So for example, every every Friday, we give homework to people who are part of the Stoic Path to have them reflect and think. Every day, they get a journaling prompt for them to journal. We didn't even talk about journaling, but that's a big part of uh, Stoic reflection and practice. Uh, and every month, they get access to a movie club. And every uh, every quarter, we do a Stoic book club. So we're, we're really trying to develop the Stoic Path as, as a place for people who look, they're, this is what they want to do. And they want to be with other people who want to do it and are on the same page as them. And they need people like myself and Dr. Kai Whiting, to, who is a philosopher of stoicism as well, uh, to, to help, to guide them through that, to be mentors to them. Uh, so you can find that at stoicismpod.com forward slash path. And you can find all of our links at just stoicismpod.com. Beautiful. And thank you. Uh, it's been an enlightening, literally conversation. <laughs> and, and I want to dig in I want to dig in more because I, I came to this. Yeah. And there's, I feel ignorant to, to some aspects of it. So I appreciate what you're doing. It's such an overlap for so many of my interest in, in the topics that we have on the show. And uh, I hope we get a lot of listeners over there and I'm eager for the book to come out. We'll promote that too, man. Tanner, thank you. Thanks for what you're doing. Thanks for giving us your time today. Thanks for giving me your time. I'm grateful. Thanks, Kevin. Take care. 